pere, 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 Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Crap Cafe. I'm your host, Cypherpole Trent, and what if I told you that Captain Kuro, one of our earliest antagonists in all of the One Piece series, has a hidden backstory that Oda has only now, in the most recent story arc, quietly revealed in the background. A backstory that, much like the despicably drippy Arlong, fully eludicates his motives, personality, and adds a whole new layer of context to his character. So let's get right into why I believe Captain Kuro is a former member and a failed candidate of Cypher Pool 9. But in order to theorize, we're going to first need to examine CP9 itself to see if it's even possible that Kuro even could be a former member of the organization. In fact, there's a lot of interesting information that we've just recently learned in the story, specifically regarding CP9 and its members. <laughs> The World Government's Cypherpole program is a series of 10 secret agencies trained to perform various forms of espionage and information gathering activities. While the existence of Cypherpole 1 through 8 is actually well known to the citizens of the One Piece world, there are actually two agencies that are kept completely off the record, Cypherpole 9 and Cypherpole 0. CP9 is specialized in assassination, destabilization, and undercover operations. Officially speaking, this branch of the government does not exist, and in order to guarantee its secrecy, the world government seems to focus on two key security measures. The first measure is in the recruitment stage. You see, the organization is composed entirely of war orphaned children from islands that are unaligned with the world government. This is the case for characters like Rob Lucci. It's also composed of the children of existing world government operatives. Uh, this is the case for characters such as Khalifa and Spandam. By recruiting in this unorthodox way, the government can ensure that the organization is made up of people who, on paper at least, don't exist. These children are then adopted by the state and forced to spend their lives as soldiers, loyal to the government. They are put through a rigorous training process in order to learn these six powers and the skills necessary to become an undercover agent. However, for the government, failure is unacceptable. Any trainees that are unable to master the six powers who fail elsewhere in their training, or even for failing in one of their missions, may be terminated from the program, which gives us a great opportunity to examine their second security measure. If somebody is terminated from Cypherpole or attempts to go AWOL, they will be hunted down and imprisoned, killed, or worst of all, promoted to CP0. In fact, we see firsthand in the story the execution of Nero by the hands of Rob Lucci for failing to meet his expectations, and then, after the events of Annie's Lobby, the entirety of the current generation of CP9 is, and I quote, forced into disgrace and hunted down by the world government. Eventually brought back where the government gave them the worst punishment of all, a promotion to CP0. During the events of Water 7 and Annie's Lobby, we met nine members of the current CP9 generation. These were Rob Lucci, Kaku, Jabra, Khalifa, Bueno, Kumadori, Fukuro, their newest recruit, Nero, and last, but definitely least, their commander-in-chief, Spandam. But you see, after the events of this arc, as I stated previously, almost all of these members were promoted to CP0. CP0 is the most dangerous and conspicuous organization within all of the world government, and currently all of the living members of CP9 are now part of this division. And I do mean all. You see, if only the powerful members of CP9 were promoted to CP0, I wouldn't really question anything, but you see Spandam, the man who got beat up by Usopp from over a mile away and then proceeded to get snapped in half by Robin, well, he also received a promotion a promotion that he doesn't appear all that happy to have received. In fact, this leads me to believe that serving on CP0 is as much of a punishment as it is an honor. This would also mean that the career pathway for anyone looking to be a cypherpole agent is to be trained from birth to either earn a spot on CP9. If you fail and you can't meet their expectations, you'll either be killed or hunted down and imprisoned. Or, if you do manage to earn a spot on the team, you'll be tasked to spend your life on various missions for the government. 
if you fail in any of these missions, you'll either be killed or imprisoned again, or, as it seems, if you are too valuable, promoted to CP0, where at the pinnacle of your professional career, you'll be forced to serve the worst people on the entire planet until you are inevitably killed in action. So, at first glance, it would seem that the world government has actually managed to successfully find a way to prevent any information leaks and ensure that anyone who leaves or fails them dies. If you don't fail them and you're able to successfully live your life as an agent for the government, it seems they've found another way of trapping you. You see, by taking the children of their current cypherpool agents and training them to become soldiers of the government as well, they can ensure that their older, more experienced agents won't abandon their children and escape the organization. If you weren't already aware, not only is Spandam's father the leader of Cypherpool 9's previous generation, but the man standing behind him on the day O'Hara was destroyed is Lasky, Khalifa's father. Which means that there are actually at least two legacy admissions in Cypherpool 9. So with such a secure process, is our theory about Kuro already dead in the water? Well actually no, not at all. Within the land of Wano, we were introduced to another former member of the Cypherpool organization. A former member of CP9 who actually managed to escape with his life and successfully live in hiding. A man who goes by the alias Who's Who. Who's Who spent his youth developing as an agent right alongside Rob Lucci, Jabra, and the other members of CP9. In fact, he even mentions the former by name, even though they haven't seen each other in over a decade. Unfortunately, however, for Who's Who, while he may have been talented, he was no match for the mighty red-haired Shanks and his crew. While on a mission to escort a certain fruit of no renown, his cargo ship was raided and the treasure he was tasked to protect was stolen. Allegedly only due to a small mistake on Who's Who's part, which, let's face it, if his fight with Jimbe is any indication, was probably due to him telling the red-haired pirates either about its existence or its importance, as it seems he is completely unable to keep a secret. So his punishment for losing the fruit, per the standard procedures, was termination from the program, and he was forced into imprisonment for an unknown period of time. After said time had passed, by the grace of Nika, he was eventually able to escape his prison where he took to the sea. Utilizing the assassination skills and techniques taught to him by the world government, he became a fearsome and notorious pirate on the Grand Line. Hiding his identity under a mask and going by an alias for fear of the world government locating and assassinating him in order to prevent any top secret information from leaking out. In fact, looking at the reaction of CP0 when they finally discovered Who's Who's existence, we can imagine that his time spent captaining the former Who's Who's pirates is probably what attracted him enough government attention in the first place that he chose to become a Toby Ropo in the Emperor Kaido's crew, potentially only aligning himself with Kaido for his own protection, as Cypherpole needs direct permission from the Gorosei in order to engage with an Emperor or their crew, under any normal circumstances at least. So, now that we know that it certainly could be possible for there to be other former members of Cypherpole lurking in the One Piece world, let's examine Captain Kuro to see if he shares any traits or similarities with the Cypherpole organization. So, let's begin by assessing the ages of both the CP9 members and Captain Kuro to see if he's even in the same age range as the other Assassin members, as they have all been trained together since childhood. So, first up, we have the youngest member of CP9, Nero, who got dropped, shot, and dropped again by his own crew. So, because of his likely death, and to keep the list simple, we're going to be following the ages of the characters in the pre-time skip era. So, at the time of Nero's likely demise, he was 20 years old. Next is Kaku at age 23, Khalifa, age 25, and Rob Lucci at age 28. There is a four-year age gap until Fukuro at age 23 and Blano age 30. Now, next up is where Captain Kuro could potentially slot in at age 33, where he would be closely followed by Kumadori at age 34 and Jabra age 35, making Who's Who the oldest known member of the current generation of CP9 at the ripe old age of 36, at least during the events of Water 7. So, does this explain why none of the other members weren't imprisoned alongside him? As 11 years prior, a majority of the members would have still been teenagers in training, so did none of them accompany him on the mission? 
But at the same time, would only a single agent have been sent to handle such an important operation? Either way, now that we can establish a basic link between Captain Kuro and the organization based on the ages of the members, let's break down some of his accomplishments as a pirate to see if his skills would be worthy of Cypherpole. Captain Kuro, during his career as a pirate, gained notoriety as one of the most fearsome pirates within all of the East Blue and earned himself the nickname Kuro of 1,000 Plans. It's even noted in an SBS that he's the second smartest man in all of the East Blue, specifically, as Oda mentions, only behind Ben Beckman, the right hand of the Emperor Shanks. Actually, it's quite interesting that Oda seems to know concretely that Ben is smarter, but we can come back to that. Regardless of whether or not he's second place, to earn the title of 1,000 Plans shows that he must have some innate talent, or much more likely, a lot of training or experience in planning and executing military operations. In fact, would it shock you if I told you that Kuro's plan to infiltrate Kai's family is actually identical to CP9's operation to steal the blueprints from Pluton from Iceberg and Water 7? Let me explain. The undercover operation of CP9 and Water 7 can be broken down into four key stages. First is begin the operation by assuming a deep undercover role. In the case of Water 7, all of the members of CP9 were each given a new identity and even go as far as to train and study in different fields to learn how to best play their role, all in order to pursue their next goal. The second stage is to begin infiltrating the life of the target, their business, their favorite bar, anything you can do to gain intel in favor with them and their associates, slowly growing closer and closer until your goal is within reach. However, every operation must eventually come to an end. The Water 7 infiltration was given a timeline of five years to work their way into the Galley Law Company before initiating Stage 3. Stage an attack on the target, with a ready scapegoat to blame for the event, in this case Nico Robin and the Straw Hats, using this chaos to assassinate the target and acquire any remaining information. The last and final step is simply to collect whatever intel or treasure that you were tasked to acquire and head off into the night like a bandit. And this all lines up with Kuro's plan one to one. Infiltrate Kaya's family under the guise of a weak, well-mannered butler, he spent years getting closer to the family, and more specifically his target, Kaya. I believe that eventually he was able to kill her parents after learning when and how he could get rid of them without anyone knowing or suspecting him. Then, once Kaya was orphaned, he became her sole paternal figure in life, bringing him even closer to her and erasing any suspicions that people may have if she so happened to die in an accident. In fact, he may have even been poisoning Kaya for some time but only enough to make her weak and bedridden, which, if you follow the Dennis system you would understand, would only serve to make her more dependent on Kuro and increase her trust in him even more. This is actually something that I was pleasantly surprised to see the live action confirm directly. Eventually, once Kuro was certain the fortune was within his grasp, he used his connections to his former crew in order to plan an attack on the island in the manor. Using the guise of a pirate attack, he planned to force Kaya into giving over her wealth, where he planned to dispose of her once and for all, leaving him to inherit her vast fortune and live freely within the world, without a single dollar on his head, all while the marines and the world government still believe him to be dead. Okay, so now that we know he uses their playbook and obviously has the same sense of style, we just need to know if he possesses any of CP9's powers or abilities. If Kuro was indeed a potential recruit for the organization, he would have been trained from childhood alongside the other members in the art of the six powers. So if my theory about Kuro is going to hold any water, I need to tie some sort of connection between Kuro and the six powers. And potentially, if he was a failed candidate, much like Nero, maybe while he was exceptional at some parts of his training, like planning covert operations, it's possible that he lacked in his ability to master the six powers. But even Nero, who was an idiot, at least mastered four of them. But frankly, if Kuro was even able to master one of the six powers, that would be enough for me to consider him a human weapon. And while immediately you might think that because Captain Kuro was introduced over 200 chapters before the introduction of CP9 that Oda couldn't possibly have given him any of their six powers, 
However, if we look closely at Luffy's explanation of Soru in Annie's lobby, you might realize that his description sounds remarkably familiar. When you guys move as if you are disappearing, I saw you moving by kicking the ground over ten times in a moment. I got the hang of it too. I'm glad I came to know that a technique for moving like that exists. So, with this in mind, we can determine that in order to use soru or high-speed movement, you need to kick the ground over 10 times in an instant in order to gain the necessary speed and momentum required to vanish. But now here is where things get interesting. While Kuro never specifically mentions soru or shave by name, it's clear that when he initiates his high-speed movement attack, that he is shown kicking the ground repeatedly. In fact, this unique maneuver is what earned it the name Pussyfoot. With this technique, he was able to become an enormous threat within the East Blue, outspeeding his enemies left and right and cutting them to ribbons without ever being seen. But either due to a lack of skill or talent, it seems he isn't able to perfectly use the technique and attacks indiscriminately. In fact, it seems as though he must enter some sort of trance before he can even begin to use it to his highest ability. This is likely a fault that alone could have been enough for him to end his time in the running to be America's next top cipher pole agent. But I don't really believe the world government has an issue with an indiscriminate killing machine, so there must be another reason for his expulsion. So if he had elite strategic skills and was a promising young recruit, why would he have been removed from the organization? If given the proper training, Kuro potentially could have continued to grow to become a top officer of CP9. Imagine a world where Kuro took the position of Spandam. Well, I think we actually received the answer to this question during Who's Who's fight with Jimbe. You see, Who's Who reveals that back when he was a member of CP9, he was tasked on a mission to escort a government ship and its cargo, the Gomu Gomu no Mi, only to be terminated and arrested for failing the mission after the ship was attacked by the red-haired pirates, and it is said that only after a small mistake on Who's Who's part, likely his inability to keep a secret, Lucky Roo was able to steal the devil fruit that he was tasked to protect. But would the world government really have only sent one operative to protect such an important fruit? If we use Nero's age of 20 as a potential starting point for Ricky agents, then looking back 11 years from the beginning of the story, you will notice that the only members of CP9 that were above the age of 20 would have been Who's Who at age 25, Jabra at age 24, Kumodori at age 23, and now, lastly, Kuro at age 22. Not to mention, if Kumodori and Jabra weren't kicked out of Cypherpole, doesn't that mean that they weren't assigned to the mission? Obviously, there's no way their presence would have changed the outcome, so the fruit would have still been stolen, and they didn't receive any punishments that we're aware of. Plus, it would make a lot more sense to send Kuro and Who's Who as opposed to any other combination of the four. Kumodori and Jabber are both idiots, and if we take Who's Who's word at face value, it's possible that, like Luchi, he was the strongest active member of CP9, at least at the time that he was still a part of it. So by pairing Who's Who, your strongest soldier, with Kuro, who, while not as talented as the other two, was an expert strategist, you've successfully made an optimal pairing. In fact, if Kuro was indeed on that ship in the East, that would not only explain his actions, but also his motivations throughout the story. The earliest canon instance we have in Kuro's timeline shows us a glimpse of him as a gloomy pirate. Despite achieving notable success and notoriety as a pirate, which is actually quite an accomplishment in the world of One Piece, and it's around this time in his life that he fakes his death and begins to enact his plan in Sir Village. But by examining him in this new light, I think we can see the full picture. <laughs> So, my theory is that after spending his formative years being trained as a weapon for the world government, Kuro aspired to be a great agent of CP9, and while he may have lacked in his development in most of the six powers, his high acuity for Soru and his impressive strategic skills made him a skilled assassin worthy of the ranks of CP9. Unfortunately for Kuro, after his senior officer botched a transport mission by leaking their secrets, the two were hunted down and imprisoned in a secret world government prison before he and Who's Who were able to escape to the sea. It was there that the two had no other options but to look to piracy to raise their station in life. Who's Who, the stronger of the two, headed to the Grand Line and began a career as a masked pirate. 
However, his devil fruit ability, giant horns, and his fighting style quickly drew the eye of the government, and once in the New World, he was forced to seek shelter under the umbrella of the Emperor Kaido. On the other side, Kuro, whose life goals were crushed when he was terminated from Cypherpole, decided to move to the East Blue, known for being the weakest of all four seas, and it's there that he exists in a perpetual state of sadness, all despite the fact that his soru and strategic skills alone allow him to dominate in the East. He is never able to enjoy his successes as a pirate after having experienced the full government immunity and importance he felt in CP9. And because he chose to stay in such a weak sea, his Rokushiki abilities never develop, unlike his counterpart in the Grand Line Who's Who, who only continued to grow even stronger. After a short career as a pirate, Kuro receives his first bounty poster, and unlike most pirates, looks at it in fear, as if he knows the world government will be sending their assassins for him soon. So concocting yet another of his banger plans, he manages to fake his death and avoids being recaptured by the government. Now, unable to continue as a pirate, he abandons his crew and devises a plan to amass a small fortune and disappear once and for all. He finds a small island, dons the mask of a meek and well-meaning butler, walks up to the biggest house in town, and convinces the owner to give him a job. Donning two golden poops on his uniform that look as shitty as he feels, he resorts to his training as an agent and becomes a perfect chameleon in Kaya's household. Over time, he successfully removed any obstacles in his way until he was the closest thing to Kaya, ensuring that no one would ever suspect him should anything ever happen to her. And finally, he enacts the last stage of his dastardly plan. Contacting his former crew and ordering them to attack the island, Kuro intends to do two things. Kill Kaya and inherit her vast fortune, and additionally, as he states, kill all the remaining members of his former crew including Django, thus successfully eliminating all of the people who know his true identity and making himself out to be the hero of the village. Thankfully for the townspeople, and most of all Kaya, his plan is foiled. By who? Well, none other than the very person who ate the fruit that ruined Kuro's life in the first place. In fact, looking back at the fight with the perspective of Kuro being in CP9, a lot of dialogue gains a whole new meaning. First, we have a few interesting statements from our resident empath Luffy, who states that Kuro doesn't know the true meaning of a pirate, and if my theory is correct, he would be spot on. Kuro was only forced into piracy. His only experience with pirates comes from the other side. He believes that pirate groups are nothing more than a collection of social outcasts, that pirates are men who care only about mayhem, and crew members are loyal pawns of the captain. He believes that whether his men live or die is all up to his orders as their leader, which we all know couldn't be further from the truth. We also have the information Kuro mentions about constantly being chased by bounty hunters and government dogs. The first time through the story when we hear this, it actually makes sense to assume that this is just the typical life of a pirate with a wanted poster, but upon repeat viewings, seeing as how few bounty hunters in the story actually go after the straw hats, Kuro, being as frightened as he is, really only makes sense when looked at through the lens of Kuro being persecuted for his relationship with Cypherpool. And after hearing Kuro's complaints, Luffy again says how unfit he is to be a pirate. But I'm sure some of you may be wondering, if Kuro was indeed on that escort ship, then why doesn't he recognize the Gomu Gomu no Mi? Well, there's actually a really simple answer to that. He does recognize it. Would it shock you if I told you that despite stretching on numerous occasions, Luffy's battle with Kuro is actually one of the few fights in all of One Piece where Luffy only uses a single named Gomu Gomu no attack? Do you know where? At the very end of the battle. After successfully wrapping his arms and legs around Kuro before he can shave away, Luffy cocks his head back and launches a crazy gum gum bell straight into his forehead. And once it makes contact, Kuro immediately loses consciousness. However, in the moments leading up to that, a series of images flashes through his mind. While at first you might assume that it's simply his whole life flashing before his eyes, I think he might be going back through his memories in a sort of Jimmy Neutron brainstorm kind of way in order to think of the last time that he's heard that name before. 
However, before he can find his answer, Luffy knocks him out cold. But if he took a little longer, would Kuro have flashed back to the name of the fruit that ruined his life? Then only to come back again and ruin his last chance of a good life and a play in three years in the making? Our last glimpse of Kuro in the series is probably the most telling of all. Kuro, again on the run as a pirate, sits solemnly at his desk besides Luffy's first wanted poster, with none other than the sun peering through the window behind him. So, do you believe Captain Kuro could have been a former agent of Cypherpool? What do you think happened to him after Sir Village? The only information that we currently know about him is that he is alive, so do you think Kuro is out there finally living his best life? Or do you think he was eventually captured by the government? If he was, I don't think they would simply kill or imprison him again. Why waste such an incredible mind? Maybe in a section of the story where our earliest antagonists are returning left and right, will be reunited with Kuro once again. After all, it's clear that he still remains in the back of Oda's mind, so if you're a fan of Captain Kuro as well, let's keep our fingers crossed that he may soon return to the story, potentially alongside the other members of CP9 as one of the newest members of CP0, but maybe this time with a few new moves. And if you disagree with this theory or you think I missed anything, please let me know in the comments below. If you liked the theory or if I at least kept you entertained, please leave a like on the video and if you want to see more of me, check out my video about Don Krieg and how he too has a whole backstory that Oda has been silently telling in the background. So thank you for stopping by the Crap Cafe and remember to subscribe and stay tuned for more of my One Piece theories. Uh, yeah.